take a moment wherever you're at and just bow your head. Get comfortable before the Lord. You may need to be seated. You may need to get prostrate right before the Lord. If you're online, you may need to stop the treadmill. But just wherever you're at, would you just get as still as you can? Just as still as you can. And I want to encourage you, it's not about the stillness of your physical body, it's about the stillness of your mind. Psalm 46, verse 1 says that He is our refuge. He is our strength. That He is our ever-present help when we're in need. So today, what do you need? He's the champion. He's the victor. He's undefeated. There are no numbers in the lost column for Jesus. He wins every year. He has every title. He has every victory. Come on, be still. Some, I feel like there's a group of people that your mind is wrestling. Just get as still as you can. For somebody today, your words have to precede your heart. You're going to have to speak. Speak into existence what's going on in your heart. Speak it. You are undefeated. You are my champion. You are the victor. You do see the end of this. You do have a plan. You will get me through this. Come on, those are declarative statements. Those are beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's where you find rest. That's where you find peace. That's where you find joy. It's to remind your soul that you're not in control. So, Father, we bow before you. Prostrate. We're as low as we possibly can. Because your word says that we must decrease so that you can increase. So, Father, just come on, wherever you're at right now, would you just release that thing back to God just right now? Just release it back to Him. Just say, it's yours. I'm bouncing it back to you, God. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a friendship conflict. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a health issue. Just bounce it back to him. Somewhere along the way this week, Lord, I picked it up. I'm giving it back to you. It's not mine to handle. I can't handle it. I don't want to handle it. So I'm just choosing rest. I'm throwing it back in your your court. It's almost like tennis. I'm volleying it back to you. So, Father, we submit it before you because it's yours. You have the conclusion. You have the fix. And so we just choose to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the victor. We choose to worship the undefeated one. May you be high and lifted up in this place. In Jesus' holy, precious, magnificent name we ask this. And everybody said, amen. Come on, if you love him with all of your heart, would you give him a shout of praise? Oh, don't just put your hands together. Would you give him a shout of praise? Oh, don't put your hands together. Come on, would we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords? He's worthy, worthy, worthy. He's worthy of it all. Hey, would you look to the person next to you, high five them, say hello. You can COVID shake them, whatever you want to do. And then you can find your seats in the presence of the Lord. So, so glad that you are here today. Welcome. Delighted that you are here. I know that uh, on a Sunday morning, there's a lot of places and a lot of things that you can be doing as we're ending our spring break week. We think it's awesome that you are here. And I don't think it's by accident that you're here. Can I get an amen? Come on. I don't think it's by accident that you're here. I think you showed up on purpose for a purpose. I think today's the timely message God has for you. Today's the song you needed to sing. Would you just receive from the Lord today all that he has for you? Now, for some of you, this is 
your first time or maybe first time in a long time. Maybe it's been a while since you've been here. We just want to say welcome. We're delighted, delighted that you are here. We know that you could be in a lot of places and you are our honored guest. Come on, if you know with me, church, come on. This place is all about real people finding real hope in this real world that's the mission of this church we will not move away from it it is going to be here till the day that jesus comes back because it's the thing that i think this community needs which is real people finding the real hope found in the real jesus and so if you are new come on can we welcome all of our guests today come on can we welcome them if you are new would you do me a favor and at some point during the service i would encourage you to do it right now But at some point during the service, would you actually text this number that's on the screen? 813-530-2525. Text the word new. Somebody say new. Text the word new to that number and uh, we won't add you to some mailing list. We're not going to show up at your house on a Monday night while you're watching The Bachelor. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. All we're going to do is send you one text and make one phone call and answer any questions that you may have about the church. Really, really excited. You are our guest today, and we hope that you feel like an honored guest today. I want to let you know that in two weeks, somebody say two weeks. two weeks. In two weeks is Easter weekend in two weeks. And listen, if you can't get excited about Easter, I don't think you're saved. And I say that tongue in cheek, but I am totally serious when I say that. I mean, I love Christmas and I love other holidays, but there's just something about Easter. I mean, it's the linchpin of our faith. It is the thing that seals it all together. And so we're going all out at Easter. Uh, we're going to have three uh, kind of main services uh, on, on Friday night at 7 p.m. And then two on Sunday at 9 and 1045. And then we are doing a first ever. We've never done this before, uh, but we are doing a sunrise service. Come on, church sunrise service at 7 a.m come on the sun is gonna rise i already looked at it at 7 18. come on we're gonna worship the s-o-n sun while the s-u-n sun comes out and it's gonna be a special time it is a unique service we're gonna take communion together it's a different message different worship so come on be a part of it we're gonna do it out in the courtyard we're gonna have breakfast for you it's gonna be a fantastic time for our church to come together. Also, one last time before I get into the word and we uh, continue in this series, Dollars and Cents, is I want to let you know that uh, next Monday we are beginning Ramsey Plus and the spots are filling up. Uh, There are a few spots left and so I want to encourage you, if you need help in your finances to get out of debt or budgeting or just get an emergency fund or maybe you don't have a reserve, I want to encourage you, we want to help you And just by way of introduction to give you a little information about Ramsey Plus, would you please check out this video? So do us a favor. We want you to sign up right now. You can do it right here while you're in church. Get plugged in. It's going to start next Monday. Get registered for that. It's brand new. Some of you are like, I've already done Dave Ramsey course. Brand new material, brand new information. And I just believe, really, this nothing flashy about this. There's not like something creative and cutesy about this whole thing. We just want to resource you and help you to get a hold and and really manage your finances the best way that you possibly can. And so we're really excited about that. Begins next Monday. Well, today is week number three of a series that we've been in called Dollars and Cents, where we've been answering the question, what would your money say if your money could talk? Let me pray, and then we're going to dive in. Grab your notes, and let's invite the Lord to just be with us in this time. Father, 
speak to our hearts. We thank you so much for just this opportunity to pause the busyness of our life. And I know spring break is coming to an end. And I just pray that right now that we would be able to see everything outside of this room and be able to glean into your word. We're going to get super practical today, Lord. And so I just pray that your sons and your daughters, including me, would be changed from the inside out. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... So I want to help you today. I'm going to be real, real practical. I want to help you today. But before I help you with the, the whole money stuff, I want to help you with lunch. Come on, somebody. So everybody's going to have lunch of some sort. I want to help you with your lunch conversation. So I want to give you a topic for you to discuss, oh, discuss over lunch. And here it is. Okay, here it is. Write it down. Did you know it's easier to stay warm than it is to get warm? Now, in the South, you don't get that, right? But if you live up north, all the northern people make fun of us because when the southern people say they're cold, they're like, you ain't cold. It just got below 70. Stop freaking out. But the truth is, it is easier to stay warm than it is to get warm. Because what happens is our body gets over in overdrive and has to work overtime to keep our body warm we burn more calories and we burn more energy just a couple weeks ago uh dakota and i were in colorado and we were skiing and we were going up the lift and it was like oh my goodness it's getting cold out and so i took my extra pair of gloves and i put them on come on dumb and dumber people come on this 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 service has seen the dumb and dumber movie the first service had no clue what i was talking about so i'm like we're in the rockies man so i Come on, there we go. So I put my extra pair of gloves on, and why? Not so I would get warm, but so that I would stay warm. Did you know your money works the same way? More to that in just a moment. But we're in week number three of this series, Dollars and Cents, where we're answering this question, what would your money say if it could talk? First of all, some of you are like, that's the creepiest topic ever. Like, why wouldn't my money talk? Assuming your money was for you, what is so interesting about if our money would talk and what Jesus said when he did talk is this, and I think this is fascinating, what our money would say if it could talk and what Jesus said when he did talk is the most fascinating thing when it comes to money and finances and faith because a lot of what your money would say assuming it was for you and a lot of what Jesus said when he did talk about money, they parallel together. And so what we've been doing is every week we've been kind of having one mega statement that our money would say if our money could talk. And so week number one, just in review, we said this about this, about our money. Our money would say this, I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. So your money would say, I can add value, I can help you, I can propel you to get to where you want to be. And let me just pause and say this to you. For some of you, this is your first week in this series. Uh, we, there is no giving campaign. So I'm not doing like a special offering. There's nothing. I'm, I'm not leading you in any direction. And I know you've been in church for any length of time. You realize that that's what pastors do. I've got, I've got no agenda for you. We're, not, we're doing an offering like we do every week. We're not doing a special offering. Yes, in a couple months, we'll give out our Church IC campaign where we do that every year. There's nothing new we're doing. Okay, nothing new. I just feel like this right before Easter is so important for us. For us, each and every one of our families to get a hold of our finances. And so we said, listen, money's not a bad thing. It can add value to your life. It's just not the meaning of life. And so I asked you this question at the end of week number one, to what ends do you want your life to be a means? Like at the end of life, what do you want people to say about you? Do you want more money or do you want more stories? What do you want people to say? What is the goal? Because until you get the end goal of what your life to be, you'll never be able to truly understand how your money can propel you, but it is not the end. Your money is just a means to get to the end. And let me just help you with something, just a little Dr. Susie today, okay? But let me just help you with this. I should have said Dr. Seuss. I forgot about that. Shoot. Uh, little doc, I didn't even realize that until I said it. I said it and it went quiet. And I was like, oh, shoot, I can't say Dr. Seuss. Uh, but to what ends do you want your life to be a means? What's interesting about this, this whole idea is this. I got to change that because I say that just about every four or five weeks. Anyways, that's a whole other conversation. Um, squirrel? Uh, to what ends do you want your life to be a means? I, I thought this. Your end can't end with you. If your end ends with you, you've missed the purpose of what money is. You cannot be the end. And so week number two, last week, here's what we said. If our money could talk, our money would say this. 
it would say, your self-control determines which one of us gets control. So your money, your, your wallet would say this, listen, you are the deciding factor on whether you get control or I money get control. And this isn't a matter of how much or how little you have, it's really a matter of your focus which one of us will really get control and I, I said this last week and I think it's important that money would say I'm a much better servant than I am a master see a lot of people did you know that 82 percent of families struggle with finances paycheck to paycheck and what's fascinating about this is I think this I don't want to hurt your feelings I'm just helping to pull out what you already know before you ever had a money issue we had a character woe See, character woes precede money issues. So for many of us, if we would get the character woe fixed, we would get the money woe fixed as well. And so today, somebody say today. So today, if money could talk, again, I, I could add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. I, which one of us gets control will determine how well you do with finances. Money would also say this, and the parallel between what Jesus said is so fascinating. Here's what money, is, could say, money would say if money could talk. It would say this. I'm easy to keep up with, but I'm difficult to catch up with. It's easy to keep up with me, but it's really, really difficult when you try to play catch up. The moment you realize after you are in a mess to go, I'm going to try to play catch up, it will take you a long time to play catch up. And don't raise your hand. Some of you are living that right now. You're playing catch up. And you're feeling the pain and the scars and the wounds and the hurt from playing catch up. But those that have yet to get into whatever money looks like, I want to, if you hear nothing, get this. Start by keeping up because if you'll keep up, it will be a whole lot easier than trying to play catch up. Can I get an amen? I like to say it this way. I've been saying this for years. Keep up, keep up, or you'll be playing catch up. And it works the same way by staying warm. If you'll, if you'll keep staying warm, you'll never have to get warm. If you keep up with your finances, you'll never have to worry about finances. Now, I realize this, and I want to say this before I move any further. Nobody died and put me in charge. I have no authority over your life. I'm not the boss of your life. If you're a Christian, you already have a boss. His name is God. If you're not a Christian, God doesn't even have authority over you right now. You're choosing to live underneath a different authority. So all I want to do today is I want to help persuade you to realize what you already know. And it's that, that, that if, you, if, if you will keep up, you won't have to play catch up. Now listen, in marriage, come on, how many know there's a lot of mystery when it comes to marriage? Come on, married people. Come on, how many when you first had a kid, you read all the books, and everybody told you I'd have a kid, and then you had a kid, and you're like, none of that, I'm, I'm learning all, come on, somebody. <laughs> right, because there's mystery in raising kids. There's mystery in marriage. How many know, there's mystery in a lot of things, but there, there, is, there should be no reason why you would go, I don't know what's going on in my finances. I just, you have no excuse for not knowing where your money is going. And there are way too many Christians, way too many believers, and this is your response at the end of the month. It, it seems to me, well, nothing should seem to you because you know what you have coming in and you should know what you have coming out. Or, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure where all of our money went, or I'm not sure what we spent it on, or I'm not sure why we don't have enough, or I'm not, I'm not sure why we put the, I'm just not sure. Or, that can't be. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever said that to your finances? Your salary didn't change, but at the end of the month, you don't have as much as you thought you would, and you're like, it doesn't, it just can't be. It just doesn't make sense. But here's what I know. <laughs> Write it down this way. We all should be knowing where our money is going. <laughs> I, I wrote that in my notes, uh, and the tech team emailed me back, and they go, Pastor, don't worry, we added a G to each one. I go, no, no, we in Ruskin. It's knowing and going. Come on. We all should be knowing where our money is going. There's mystery in so many other facets of our life, but there should no, be no mystery when it comes to where your money is going. Why? Because you have authority over your money. 
The government doesn't have authority over your money. Your kids don't have, you have authority. You don't have authority over every part of your marriage. Come on, married people. You don't have an authority over, you have, you have all of the authority over that. And listen, I need you to know, you better be knowing where your money is going. I told you I'm gonna be super practical today. I'm rolling up my sleeves. We're gonna get practical. So money would say this. If money could talk, money would say this to you. Money would say, I'm easy to track, but lose track of me and you'll lose your peace of mind. Don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want you in your heart of hearts to answer this. Have you ever lost your peace of mind when it comes to finances? Many of us have. I have. A lot of us have. And here, I don't, want to, I don't want to simplify it. I don't want to make it too simple. But the truth of the matter is, if you and I will just keep track of where our money is going, we will have a peace of mind when it comes to our finance. Now, this principle right here, it works if you're a Christian and it works if you're not a Christian. We all, every one of us, I don't care if you're married, you're single, you're dating, you're a high schooler, maybe you're a widow, maybe, maybe you're on a fixed income and you're a little bit older, maybe you're a senior citizen, it doesn't matter. Here's what I know, we all, every one of us, we need a plan to where our money is going. We need a plan. And before you think I'm going to go in the direction you think I'm going to go in, can I tell you today, now we'll let Dave Ramsey fix what I'm saying right now, but can I tell you what's not going to fix you is a budget. Come on, somebody. You know why? Because every one of us, we've had a budget or we have a budget. Where does your budget live? Who the heck knows? We got rid of that computer. It's in some file, filed away, come on, you spent three and a half days working on that budget, and in three and a half minutes, the budget is worthless now. Again, I'm not against budget, but for today, I don't think budget is the answer. But you need a way. You need a way to figure out where your money is going. You need a simple way. Because here's what you and I know about a budget. A budget is a theory that rarely reflects reality. It's like, if everything goes perfect, that's what I'll have at the end of the month. Come on, raise your hand right now if a month has gone perfect in your life financially. Nobody, right? Braces and broken this and this and air conditioner and this. And, and you're like, oh my gosh. In a budget, I'm not against budgets. I'm just against budget being the end-all be-all. Because we don't look at it every day. We don't manage it every day, but we do, listen to me, we need, write this down, we need a simple way to track your actual spending. You need a way. You need a simple way to track your actual spending. Now, how many of you, you've, you've been married longer than 20 years? Come on. Now, April and I were 20 years this August we've been married. I'll never forget we got, we got married, I got my first job, April was a stay-at-home mom, and so she worked harder than me, she just didn't bring any income, come on somebody, but she worked harder than me, but there was no income from what she was working on, I'm hoping my legacy comes later, but they want to be in ministry, so I don't know if it is, but in Jesus' name, my eternal legacy will be great, but nonetheless, I work, and I won't tell you my salary, it was not a great salary, and I'll never forget, and this was 20 years ago, I'm dating myself when I say this, but we, got, we actually got a paycheck. There wasn't direct deposit back in those days. Come on, remember those days? And I got my paycheck and I would drive to Bank of America. Now this isn't a plug for Bank of America. It just happened to be where we bank. Then I would drive to Bank of America and I would cash my check and they would say, how do you want your check, your cash, sir? And I would say, I'll take a 20 because how many of you know that's what I got paid. I'll take a 20, I'll take two 10s, I'll take six fives, I'll take 17 ones and I'll take 38 quarters. And I would drive home, I kid you not, this is the truth, ask April, I promise you. We would take all the money and we would lay it out on the table and we would have what's called the envelope system. And we would put, we'd, we'd put, we'd put tithe, tithe had an envelope, mortgage had an envelope, groceries had an envelope, and I promise you, at the end of the week, every single, I promise you, every penny was accounted for. Now, praise God, there's better systems than an envelope system 20 years later. I mean, technology has improved, other things have improved. I don't know what it is for you, but you need a simple way to track your actual 
spending. You need a place to where you can go, this is what's coming in and this is what's going out. Now here's the truth that everybody knows. And this is where I want to land for the next few moments. This is the plan that you know, and you know this, you know this, you know this. Write it down in your notes this way. When you know you're going to log it, you are more inclined to hog it. I told you I was going to be practical. Cookies bottom shelf today. Now it was at this point in the message where I thought, it'd be really cool if. I thought it'd be really cool if, but I'm not going to do this because I don't want to embarrass you, but I thought this would be really cool to ask the church how many people have downloaded an app to like track their calendar, their calories and how much they're eating. And I thought, I'm not going to do it, but I thought it'd be really cool because there's a lot of people that have logged their, their calories in a system. And I'm not going to ask you because I don't want to embarrass you, but I thought maybe this would be a great example that we would understand because there's a lot of people that have like downloaded those apps to track their calories. And I'm not going to ask you, but I am going to ask you, how many of you have done that before? <laughs> many of us, right? We've done it. And here's what you've done, and here's what I've done. You've tracked it all out, and it's the end of the day, and you're like, I got 400 calories left. Ice cream tonight. And then you said, dang it, the ice cream is 759 calories. Fine, you put your gym shorts on. I'll go run two more miles just so I can have ice cream. We've all done something like that. Why? Because, listen, this is important. Just like with your health, when you start to log it, or to track it, you start to hog it. So when you find a simple way to get your finances on an Excel spreadsheet or a, a Google Doc or maybe just in your notes on your iPhone, whatever, and you write it all out, you realize, listen, once I'm intentional about logging it, then I become a little bit more intentional about hogging it. There were two seasons in April and I's 20 years of marriage. I already listed one of them where we lived paycheck to paycheck, where it was like we needed every single paycheck. And if we didn't get every, like if we missed one paycheck, oh my gosh, it was, life was going to be crazy. The, the second one was when we moved back down from Florida, we moved in with my in-laws. And I'll never forget standing at the counter and I, looking at our budget, looking at our debt, looking at everything that we were struggling with, and looking at April going, this is never going to work with the money that's coming in. It just doesn't make sense and it was in that moment where i realized i've got to log it so that we can be intentional with hogging it now this principle will help you in one of two seasons of your life 82 percent i mentioned this earlier 82 percent of you and i were in this season that i'm going to mention to you remember this don't don't lose sight of this but this principle, this principle right here, it matters in both categories. One is this. In the paycheck to paycheck seasons, this habit that I mentioned earlier will take the pressure off. Then you don't have to worry about saying yes or no. Why? Because you're logging it. And if you'll log it, then you can say, no, I'm going to hog it. I, I know hog's a bad word. It just rhymes. You can come up with a better word. But the point I'm making is this. You can say no to things that you really want so that you can say yes to the things that you really need. So in the paycheck, the paycheck seasons, you realize I am going to hog it so that the end result is what we want. Now, for some of you, the other 18%, you're in the other category where you've got plenty. You're not a bazillionaire, but you don't need every paycheck. April and I, we've gotten to the place where we have an emergency fund and we've got almost we've got almost a couple months reserve in our in our checking account our savings account why because i want to live in this next one i want to live with the other 18 percent because in the years of plenty this habit that i just mentioned earlier it puts pressure on you because when you're in the 18 percent, when you're in this category here's what happens you start to ask yourself two questions how much money am i spending on me so again, I don't say this to guilt you. This is not, I, I, I didn't, didn't want to say this, but I feel like I just need to tell you this. I don't, I don't need a thank you. I don't need a great job. That's not what I'm looking for. I was just able to do this. So when we got our stimulus check last week, the first thing that April and I did is we tithed off of it. N not, not even necessarily because we should have, or we, we did it because we could. 
So we, we wrote our first check to the church. Why? Because we are not, we're not bazillionaires. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But I've got more. I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. I've got a couple of paychecks in the bank. So now when something comes in, I can go, no, no, I don't need to just buy all this stuff. Although we did, we fixed up our house and did a lot of things. But the first thing we did is we said, the first 10%, we're giving back to the house of God. And again, that's, I'm not putting that on you. I'm just saying we were able to do that because we are living in a season where we're saving up. Are you hearing me? Just trying to help you. When you log it, you have a tendency to hog it. So here's the, here's the ask, and then I'm going to get practical with you. Here's the ask I'm asking for everybody. Last week, if you weren't here last week, I gave you an eight-week challenge. And I said, take the next eight weeks, and I want you to do two things. I want you to pick a percentage and give it away. And if you think I've got a hidden agenda, don't make it Wellspring. You pick a percentage and give it away. There's a lot of local mission partners. In fact, if you think I'm trying to sales pitch you, give it to another church. That's how serious I am about this. Pick a percentage and give it away. But once you do that, which number two is important, I want you to process the internal tension that that causes. Because even tithing now that we've been tithing, I've been tithing for 25 years, even giving that $700 back to the church on that stimulus check, there was a, oh, and that's how I know I'm doing the right thing. And I'm just trying to encourage you, encourage you, encourage you, pick a percentage and give it away and process through that internal tension that it causes you. Here's the challenge I'm asking you today. For the next eight weeks, I'm asking you to do this. This one's a lot easier. <laughs> Maybe a lot easier. Maybe if you're organized, this is a lot easier. I'm asking you to document your spending for the next two weeks, two months, for eight weeks. Document your spending. Find a way to do spy on your money. Get a, a Google Doc. You can get. There's a lot of lap, apps out there where you can check your 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 finances. You do online banking, and some of you are like, "Well, I do an American Express. Everything comes off my American Express." Fine, do it that way. But find a way to track your spending for eight weeks. And once you've done that, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Take an inventory. Sit down and look at it. Take an inventory and adjust if necessary. Two months. Now, for some of you, if you're married, for some of you, one of you spouse members, you love me and this is the greatest sermon you've ever heard in your entire life. The other person hates me and wants to curse me off the stage. And I realize that. Why? Because opposites attract. So I get it. I totally get it. So that's why I'm telling you right now, listen to me, especially if you're on the other side, listen, this is not for the rest of your life. If God asks you to do that, fine. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you for two months, for eight weeks, to track your spending, your actual spending, then sit down and look at it and adjust it if necessary. Now, some of you are like, well, that's easy for me because I know where all my money going. I got the printout, da 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 Okay. But knowing you can know is not the same as knowing. Because I hear it all the time from American Express people. Well, I just, I just put everything on my Amex card and I just print it out and I pay it off and get points. Fantastic. Praise God, do it that way. But knowing you can know is not the same as knowing. So I'm asking you to sit down and process where your money is going for eight weeks. Take an inventory of it. Adjust if necessary. Don't do it for the rest of your life. Just do it for eight weeks. Can I get an amen? Now, for some of you who are like, this is really good practical information, but you haven't even opened up the Bible yet. So here you go. Matthew, the tax collector, who was one of Jesus' disciples, it's so, so fascinating. Like, I love reading the Bible. I, I think I, I don't, I don't, I've learned in now my, my, my studying of the Bible, I don't read to learn the Bible. I read to enjoy the Bible because if I enjoy the Bible, then I read the Bible more. Now, I don't know who that's for. Maybe that's for somebody who just doesn't enjoy the Bible. I've just learned to enjoy the Bible. And if I learn to enjoy reading the Bible, then I learn from the Bible. It's like reading a book that you don't want to read. It's like, why would you want to read it? And I learn nothing from it. I skip pages and I daydream for 17 and a half chapters. 
I've learned to love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so Matthew is fascinating. Matthew is a politician. He's a tax collector. And he becomes one of Jesus' 12 disciples. It's just so bizarre. Like if you study the Bible, it's just so backwards sometimes. But Jesus did things backwards in our culture. And here's what's interesting. It's a story. You've heard it before. I'm not going to go into a lot of it. I'm just going to read the first, first section. Here's what the Bible said. Jesus is having this interaction. It's a parable. So here's what he said in Matthew 25. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me just stop and say this to you. The kingdom of heaven is not a place that you go one day. And I think that's where a lot of Christians get it wrong. The kingdom of heaven is not a, it's not a location. It's the presence. It's an experience. It's bringing. What's the Bible say? Your kingdom come, your will be done. That we carry the kingdom of God everywhere we go. So we get the kingdom of God here, and we get the kingdom of God there, and we get the kingdom of God there, and we get the kingdom of God there. The Bible says, and the kingdom of God can be illustrated. Here's how you can sum up my kingdom, Jesus said. It's like a story illustrated of a man going on a long trip. So this man's going on this long trip, and, and so he's getting ready to leave, and he's packing his bags and doing his deal. And you've heard this before. And it says this, he called together his servants, and what did he do? He entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Now, you may not know this, and if you're new to the Bible, this will help you understand the Bible. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus would tell all of these parables that had this like illustration of not the truth, but it had truth in it, so to speak. It's not a real story, but it had truth in it. And what's interesting about every parable is every parable has a God character and a you character. Or me character so when you look at this parable it's very easy to look at this parable and go the character of god is the wealthy man he possesses everything and to look at the story and go the servant is us it's you and me and that he's the owner and we're the managers the story goes on and i'll i'll, I'll i won't i won't give it all to you in the scripture you can go read it on your own but the story goes on and i would ask you this how much of the wealth did the wealthy man own not a trick question what is it all he owned a hundred percent of it did he not how much percentage did the servant own not a trick question zero the wealthy man owned it all and the servant owned zero the story goes on and the wealthy man gave the servants that's you and me some five amounts of money and then another two amount of money and one one amount of money and oftentimes i would read this story and go man god must have favored the guy with five or her with five because maybe they were maybe their authority was bigger maybe their their scope of influence was bigger but then i started thinking about what is the point of this parable well here's the point of this parable it is the point of the parable is not the amount that they were asked to manage Listen to me, the point of the parable is what they did with what they were asked to manage. And if you know the story, two of these managers were great. The Bible says that they doubled it and that the wealthy man or God was, was proud. But one squandered it and the Bible actually, man, says that God cursed him to like this torment. And what's fascinating about this is the point of the parable is not how much money you have. The point of the parable is not how much money I have. The point of it all is what you do with what you have. It's, it's get, get as much as you can. Have the bigger this and the better, bigger that. And the, go, have a blast with it. But it's what you do with it that matters. In fact, you may want to write this down this way. How we manage money, it speaks volumes to who and who's we are how you and i handle the money the resources that god has given to us it speaks so loud to who and whose we are so i'm going to get real practical i'm going to invite the team out and i'm going to get real practical with you and i'm going to give you an illustration that i think is going to help you when it comes to managing our money and does god not want me to have stuff does he want me to have stuff and I, uh, most of you know about three weeks ago, I had uh, surgery. I had part of my colon removed and it was just a crazy, crazy deal. Also, I'm gonna be 40 next month. And so again, I'm getting a little bit older. And while I was in the hospital, the Lord just had me on this like legacy. I don't know how your relationship with God is, but God will have like these ongoing, like, like not just a, a moment, it'll be like moments. 
And so the whole time I'm in the hospital for a week and I just, legacy, your legacy, your legacy. And maybe, maybe because I was getting ready to go under anesthesia, maybe it's because I, I'm turning 40, maybe it's because my son is gonna graduate next year from high school. And I just legacy and my legacy and my legacy. And God just said this. He said, your legacy is all you take with you. It's it, your legacy. And I started to think about my legacy and next week I'm gonna preach on really what I feel like God, God gave me some stuff in the hospital. I'm gonna preach it just live out of my life from when I was in the hospital a couple weeks ago. Here's just, here's just to wet your whistle. Here's what God said to me, that my legacy, I don't know if this is for you, that my legacy is the sum total of my pursuits, not the sum total of my purchases. That my legacy is what I pursue. That my kids are looking at what I'm pursuing. My wife is looking at what I'm pursuing. And I got out of that hospital and I just, I told the staff, like, I'm ready. People on the, the, they're like, how are you feeling? You look better today. I go, I'm just ready. I don't know if I physically feel better, but I'm spiritually ready to, I'm ready to do some stuff for the kingdom of God. I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. And my pursuits are what matter, not my purchases. So I begin to think about this when it comes to our purchases and our pursuits. Now, listen, everybody in church, even watching online, you are building your life on something, something. There is a foundation to your life. There is a bottom to your life. There is a, if it does not have this, everything falls out. I would just ask you, what are you building your life on? And then every one of us, these aquariums, they represent your capacity. This is your life. You can't fix the amount of time, you can only fix what you do with the amount of time. You can't fix anything, you can't change the day that you die, all you can change is what you put in and what you take out. And here's what for most of us, this is what most of us do, this is what we got. And these Legos, they represent our stuff, and what we do oftentimes is we do this. I just need, I need bigger. I need a bigger house. I need, I need, I need a, who, who can just do a two car garage? I need a three car garage. You know what, two cars, three cars. I'm gonna do three cars. And what we do is we just fill it up and we fill up our life with a whole bunch of stuff. There's nothing wrong with the stuff, but we, we fill it up and we just, oh, more stuff and bigger this and, oh, we, you can't just have one house. You gotta have a vacation house to go to. And we just go, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we just fill it up. Vacation house and this, you know what? I need a boat. I need a boat. I'm going to get a boat. I need a boat. And we get a boat and we just fill it up and we 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 just fill it up and we fill it up with as much as we can. And then we come to our senses and then we go, oh, but my family's important. My family's important. So I, I got to put my family in. I mean, I got to raise a great family and a godly family. And so we put our family and we got, oh, we got friends. We got great friends because we need people to raise our kids together and collaborate. And our, our family's really, our fa friends are really important. And so we go, that's important. And so we lay, we, we lay our friends on, on all of our stuff. And then we go, man, our education. Then we got we to gotta get the right grades and have the right education. And right now I'm contemplating this fall going back to school to get my doctorate. And I just want to do that. I want to be like the first person in my family to have a doctorate degree. And so, you know, focus on our education. Our education is important. And then we do that. And then we, we come to church and you come on Sundays. And for the vast majority, we've come every couple months and we get plugged in and we're like, we're going to do this. And we hear a message, put God first. And then we, we, we just, there's just not enough room and then we go we just got a, the principle of, of put god first and you've been made on purpose for a purpose and you, people are dying and going to hell all around you in your neighborhood and we got a witness and then we go but i got to do this and then what happens is we're just trying to shove and go if i just if i just had more money if i just had more capacity if i just had a better job and the truth is your capacity will never change it just doesn't Fit. What do you do when it doesn't fit? Well, the good news is Jesus told us about it. In Luke chapter 12, here's what Jesus said. He said this, that is why I tell you, listen church, this is why I'm telling you, don't worry about everything that's going on in life and the political thing and the corona this and the that mask this and this and this and this and, this and, and don't worry about it all. It goes on. I, I love how practical it gets. Whether you have enough food, eat or drink or clothing to wear for life is more 
than food. I mean, some of you, you're like, I just need more clothes. You got up this morning and you're like, I got nothing to wear to church. I better go buy more clothes. And you've got a closet full of clothes. I, I got the perfect outfit. I got no shoes. So let me go buy some new shoes. What's the Bible? There's nothing wrong with stuff. Jesus goes on to say there's something more important. Verse 31, he says this. So seek, come on church, seek the kingdom of God. So what if, what if it did fit? What if we did have enough capacity? What if we just prioritized God first? His kingdom first. And we said, God, you go in first. And then we hear a message like this and you don't have to feel guilt or pressure or like, oh my gosh, I'm failing at this. And when I say, hey, it's time, I'm gonna tell you this at the end and Pastor John's gonna tell you this, you're gonna get five Easter and invested in invite cards and I'm gonna tell you unashamedly to give five invested in invite cards out. And you hear something like that and you go, listen, I just put it first, I'll put it in. I don't have to worry, it just goes in. And then I have my family, my family's important and I gotta take them out and I gotta spring break with them and do all that. And I put my, my family in and then, and then my friends, I gotta go them out and it's just order. And I put them right here and then, and then I got my education. Can I do that? Can I save money and get an education? Well, we put it in first. And then we say, you know what? You know, we, we gotta build a be better legacy. Our legacy matters and we gotta do that. And then we just, we just put it all in and then you go, oh my gosh, I just don't know if I have enough room. Because all this stuff is bad, right? Well, no. Because here's what happens. You want a bigger, you want a bigger house? No problem. It fits. It fits. You, you want a three-car garage? No problem. It'll fit. You just gotta have order. You want the vacation home? It, no problem. It fits. You, 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 wanna get, you wanna get the better this or the new boat? You go, know, boats are bad, right? No, boats are fine. It's just gotta be the right order. You want a better this or a bigger this? Or better, ooh, a little bit over here, and we got this. And, and what happens, some spills out, and you go, I don't need it, because look at all that God's blessing me with. Then what you realize is this, it will all fit if you just get the right, shake it, just get the right order, it'll all fit, and then some will spill out because you have it. Listen, I'm trying to tell you, it'll all fit, church. It'll all fit. It'll all fit. It all fits. Look, it all fits. It will all fit. It's all about the order. It's all about the order. It doesn't fit. When you wait to put your purpose in Jesus at the end, it will not fit. You don't have the capacity. But when you put it first, and then your family, then your friends, then your education, then your legacy, and then you get the new boat, and then you get the bigger house. They will all fit. You don't have to choose either or. You can have both. It's all about order. And then you look at your life, and you look, I thought I needed all that. But look, none of that even matters because look at the blessing that God's given to me in my life. I'm trying to help you, church. I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to help you understand that God's not trying to get anything from you. He wants to give to you. So I'm asking you, listen to me, I'm asking you, I'm asking you for eight weeks to log it, to log it, log it, log it, to dock, spy on your finance, log it, log it, log it. Then once you do it, then figure out where it's going and then readjust. And I just believe, I don't know about you, but I believe that this life is okay. This life will satisfy for a season. You, got, you notice it's halfway in. God's halfway in charge. My purpose is halfway a priority. But I just think, come on church, I think there's a better way. I think you can get it all. I think you can have it all. I think you can get it all. If it's according to God's will, you can get what you want in life as long as the foundation is him and his purpose. I just believe it. I believe it. So would you do me a favor? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed with nobody looking around. I want to ask you this question. I won't embarrass you. I won't call you out. But I do want to ask you this question. How many of you would say this? I, I'm willing to at least pray about taking that eight-week challenge. To log. To log where it's going. To log where my finances are going. To log where it's going. I'm willing to at least pray about it. Some of you are like, I'm all in. I'm ready to do it for eight weeks. 
But if you're at least going to pray about it, I would love the opportunity to pray for you. This doesn't do anything for me. I just want to pray for you. So if that's you is a commitment to God, would you just lift your hand up? I want to pray for you. And not every hand's going to go up, and I don't want every hand to go up because I don't want you to lie. But if you're really going to pray about it, lift your hand up. I want to pray for you. So many. I want to pray for you. So Father, with every ounce of ability that I have in me from the, from the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would allow each and every person to take the step of faith to log it to get a handle on our finances, to understand the extra stuff is fantastic. Praise God. God wants us to be blessed. But order is what you're looking for, God. So teach us to flip the script to get the right order so our life can be blessed in the most ultimate way. Now, with your head bowed and with your eyes closed and nobody looking around, how many of you would say this? I know that being in a relationship with Jesus is the most important thing, and I'm just not. Somewhere along the way, you got out of line. Maybe you've never given him your life. Maybe you've never trusted him, but you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're not sure where you would spend your next breath if it was an eternity. Today's the day. Today's the day. It's not next week. It's not next month. It's not when you feel like. It's not when you ask. It's right now, right this moment. If you've never done that before in this room or online, I would ask you to pray this simple prayer. Just say, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you be my Savior, and would you be my Lord? I give you my life as a sacrifice for yours. Now, with your head bowed and with your eyes closed, with nobody looking around, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'm going to ask you on the count of three to lift your hand up. I won't embarrass you. I won't call you out. I won't make you do anything that would cause you to be any, anything more than comfortable. But if you prayed and you meant it, I'm going to ask you on the count of three to lift your hand up. One, two, three. I prayed that prayer. Just up real tall and right back down. Anybody else? I see you, sir. Right here. Right here. Yeah, awesome. 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 Anybody else? We see you right here. Fantastic. Praise God. Anybody else? That's me. You've made the greatest decision of your... That's it. It's as easy as that. There's nothing else you need to do because Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. One more time. Anybody else? Several in this service. If you're online and you prayed that prayer, we've got a pastor right there. We'd love to know that you prayed that. One more time. Anybody else? So good. So proud of you. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for these three individuals in this service that gave their life to you and for the three that trusted you last service. I pray that you would set their feet on solid ground. I pray that they would stick to your church and stick to your, to your house and stick to your plans like Velcro, God. And they would stay focused and glued to you. And I pray that you would do the unthinkable in their life. They would be blessed beyond their wildest imagination. We worship you. We honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on, let's give God praise.